Straight from the Mayor's Mouth, with Matthew Dickerson from Dubbo Regional Council. Hello everyone and welcome to Straight from the Mayor's Mouth. Hello there Matt, how are you? Yeah, really good thanks. And I want to mention a special anniversary this week. Your wedding? Not my wedding, no, that is a special anniversary, but I want to mention that this week, it's a few months ago that one happened. But Tony McGrain, who was a great servant of Dubbo, mm. spent eight years and ten days as the Mayor of Dubbo. He's is that the right? 34th Mayor of Dubbo. Yes. He passed away very early, way too early. Mm. About 58 he was when he passed away. Well, that's far too early, wasn't it? Far too early. And that was 19 years ago this week. So 19 years ago? Yeah, yeah. So he passed away on the... 15th of September, right. 2004. Yes. So, yeah, so the 19th... It doesn't seem like that. It really doesn't. 19 years ago that Tony passed away. Time does fly, doesn't it? It does indeed. The other thing that's of interest, I think, is that... So, just on Tony, hmm. he's the third longest serving mayor of Dubbo. Right. And he was first elected on the 14th of September, 1991. Hmm. Someone else was first elected on the 14th of September, 1991, was Alan Smith. Okay. Yes, and yes. so he ended up being our... 36th Mayor of Dubbo, right. and he was our fifth longest-serving mayor, having served seven years and 149 days. Of course, Alan Smith is still with us. I was us. going to say, Alan's still around, isn't he? He's pretty sure he's still here. Yes, Absolutely yes. still with us, yes. I, I still chat to Alan on a Excellent. semi-regular basis, which is great to have his knowledge and wisdom there. So it's the 32nd anniversary of when Alan was first elected to council. Right. Again, right. same anniversary for Tony, but Tony's, of mm. course, not with us anymore. So, mm. yeah, so I think Tony did do a great job. Of course, he went on then on the 27th of March, 1999, he was elected to state parliament while he was still mayor of That's Dubbo right. City did, Council. He did, did serve a term there. Yes. And, well, more than a term, because he served right until he died in 2004, but his nickname, of course, was Landslide right. because he won that election by 14 votes. Oh, is that right? 14 votes back <laughs> 14 in 1999. That's right. Several recounts later. There's a great they, play on word there, isn't it? The old landslide then. It wasn't quite a landslide. Very close. That's right. And and I heard that from some other pollies in state government about the fact that you know, Landslide McGrain, and obviously <laughs> the, the joke was that he won by 14 votes, yes. of course. So, yes. yeah, so great servant. In fact, both have been great servants, mm. Tony McGrain and Alan Smith. So good to recognise both of their contributions. Oh, indeed, indeed. Of course, in our top five, Les Ford was the longest serving mayor of Dubbo, and I'm including Dubbo before the amalgamation with Talbagar, and then Dubbo City Council after the amalgamation, and now Dubbo Regional Council. Uh, Les was the 26th mayor of Dubbo, served 14 years and 12 days, and he actually passed away in office on the 17th of December 1964, but he was also the state member from 1959 to 1964. So for the five years there, he was both the mayor and the state member and again passed away in office, which meant election of a new mayor and election of a new state member. Errol Sarissia was the second longest serving mayor, 24th mayor of Dubbo, 10 years and 358 days. Tony McGrain, as I mentioned, eight years and 10 days. Norm Cox, the 30th mayor of Dubbo, eight years and two days. And Alan Smith, was the 36th Mayor of Dubbo. Now, mate, uh, during the week you had a council standing committee, and I always love talking about this because I think most people out there love to know how we're progressing as a city, and one of the great ways to indicate how we're progressing as a city is through our building summaries or building approvals. Now, I've got a few little figures sitting here in front of me, and there's some fairly exciting figures coming forward here, so you better talk us all through it. Well, before I talk about that, one of the things that's fascinating, I think, at the moment is you've got a lot of competing interests in Dubbo, but also across the nation. Mm. We know that interest rates have gone up, yes. and that's been a deliberate process to try and calm down some spending, try and put a bit of a lid on inflation, and there's mm. no doubt that's been successful. And if you talk to builders, you talk to financiers, certainly the heat has gone out of the housing market. Yes. The, the demand there was very high, and the supply was limited, so prices were going up at incredible rates. Mm. That's achieved its objective from that perspective. You also, because of so much demand, you also had building prices, materials, mm. and lack of tradespeople were mm. pushing building prices up. And mm. I've heard figures, and I don't have anything official for these ones, but mm. anywhere from, say, 30% to 50% increase right? over the last Goodness three years. Me. So what it might have cost you to build a house three years ago, yeah. add 30% to maybe 50% to wow. build that house now. So with those two things in mind, more expense mm. to build a house and less ability to borrow money, mm. you would say, well... 
definitely. You think building approvals would be down on that? Exactly right. Now, on the flip side of that, yes. we know the demand to move to regional locations such as Dubbo, mm. has been very high. People in metro areas have discovered that, wow, I don't need to live a one-hour commute from my particular workplace because I can work from home. Yes. I could live a five-hour commute away. I could live in Dubbo and still work for that same Absolutely. organization. So that's been really effective. So that's increased demand mm. in regional locations such mm. as Dubbo. But then we've also got this renewable energy zone we talk yes. about. And the 6,000 construction workers we're going to need for that and mm. some other projects around mm. Dubbo over the next decade, and I'm not saying within a decade, I'm mm. saying we'll need that for at least a decade. And these aren't pie-in-the-sky figures. These, these are genuine figures, aren't they? We've done analysis. We've had consultants mm. do reports for us to give us some sort of number about what we'll need. So you're absolutely spot on. It's mm. not just me plucking a figure out of thin air. No. These are reports that we've had from experts in the field. So you Add all those together and yeah. you think, well, what's going to happen to the housing market and to those housing numbers? Well, I'll give you some historical context, right. if you like. Yes. The best year ever for housing approvals was the 2015-16 financial year. Okay. And that was 488 approvals. And that's a combined number of single dwellings and other residential dwellings. So things like medium density housing, things like dual occupancy, so anything that's not just right. a, a normal so, single So these dwelling. just aren't extensions. These are a genuine type of operation. Correct. Right? That's yep. exactly okay. right. So 488 is the best year ever, and that was interesting because 2015-16 was, things were going fantastically in mm. Dubbo, mm. and the 12th of May 2016, so towards the end of that financial year, was the amalgamation. Oh, okay, right, right. Yep. From that, there, that sense. Yeah. afterwards, all the figures we have – are combined figures. Okay. So this is now combining Wellington yeah. with Dubbo. And we see a slow decline in figures from that peak of 2015-16 mm. down to the 2019-20 financial year. So this is still prior to COVID? Well, it's probably that year would have just had a little bit of COVID in yeah. it. So COVID really started to take effect around March, maybe April 2020. Mm. Mm. So towards the end of that year, we were down as low as 210. Wow, that's a significant drop, wasn't it? It is. Yeah. And, and that was not just a one-off drop. So the year after the amalgamation, it dropped to 409. The next year, so we had a new council elected, it dropped mm. down to 308. Mm. Next year, 277. Next year, 210. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, yeah, it's a huge drop. A huge drop, mm. that's right. Now we've got our new council in place and we've got those things we talked about. You've got some post COVID impacts of all of that. Yeah. And so if you look at the last two completed years, mm. you've got 458 in the 2021-2022 year, 468 in mm. the 2022-2023 year. Mm. That's so a huge getting, recovery. It is, that's yeah. right. And we're getting up close to that 488, the peak of the all these building approvals forever. Yes. Then you get this financial year so far. It's now, like a little drum rolls feeling for this. <laughs> I've got that sort of feeling that sort of helps you right. build for this one. Thank yes. you. Good work. <laughs> now, we've only got two months of this financial year. So mm. take into account that we're extrapolating from two months out to 12. So mm. you've got a fair bit of variability. But if building approvals go at the same rate they have so far this financial year, mm. we would hit... 576. That's amazing. That would smash. That's an extraordinary figure. So yeah. that's, that's what we're expecting well, based upon where the, the figures are sort of leading? There's so many variables in there. Mm. You talk to some people in the development industry and you might say, well, no, there's no way we'll hit that because we've got so much pressure with interest rates mm. and so much pressure with building materials and, and lack of tradies. But then the demand, the I don't counter, know. That that's right. There's a demand, isn't there? It's really demand. coming in. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So I don't know that that's where we're expecting it to go. Mm. That's based on the first two months. As the year progresses, we'll get a bit clearer indication. Mm. But I'm pretty confident we'll have a record year. Mm. Whether it'll be 576 or not, I'm not sure about, but certainly a, a record year I, I'm expecting. Mm. And the other thing to look at is the total value of DAs determined mm. so far this year is 78% higher than the equivalent period last wow. year. So it, if we look at the first two... Is there a reason for that? Is that, that because of more approvals or is it because of the, uh, the nature of the, the, the occupancies and the dwellings and things like that? Well, probably a bit of both. Mm. You've, probably, you, you've certainly got more approvals, so mm. that's good. And then some of those have been more expensive, obviously. So, yeah, yeah I think overall you, you're seeing that. But the ratio has still been roughly about the same. So if I look at, for example, the 2022-2023 completed year... If I look at a breakdown, single dwellings were 214, mm. 
other residential dwellings were 254. Okay. If I look back at the previous year, 229 and 229, so they're both the same. Mm. Previous year, it, it actually had other residential dwellings a bit lower than single dwellings. This year so far, we've got 40 single and 56 other. Mm. So that's kind of within the ballpark. It's not as if suddenly the ratio is dramatically out. No. So I think that's probably indicative of a, yep. of a normal activity so far, but just increased activity. Mm, mm. So that 78% increase, if that continues on, that'd be fantastic. Mm. Again, it's on two months. I'm basically mm. on two months so far. But it's an exciting start. It's an exciting yeah. start. And with all those other pressures that should be putting downward pressure Absolutely. on there, we've still got that upward yeah. pressure. So that's all very exciting. Mm. Now, speaking of the nature of uh, development, uh, we talked about this in last week's podcast. During the week, uh, you had your mayoral or your mayoral developers forum. Now it looks as though you had about uh, sixty or so people attend the night, which is a great roll-up. I think it's fantastic to have so many people there. The night itself, um, it went well. I think so. Mm. One of the things about these developers forums, and I probably mentioned a little bit last week, but it is interesting. Some people are highly critical of them because we put developers and development staff in the one room together, mm. and I'm I'm quite comfortable with that. But it it goes right back to when I was first elected as mayor of Stabo City Council, September 2011. And I had lots of people, because you get someone in a position that's new in that position, and lots of people mm. then want to take up something that they mightn't have had success with previously. Mm. And lots of developers contacted me and said, we want to fix this development, it's taking too long. And the solution that I put in place was by December that year, we had our first mayoral developers forum. Developers in the room, financiers, builders, etc., cetera, our mm. development staff, all in the room together yep. to talk about development and see how we can make it happen or work better. As you say, getting all parties together just simply to communicate. Correct. And not mm. I'm not suggesting in any way, shape or form there is anything that's happening that's not legal and probity is still being followed. There's, there's no suggestion here of anything happening that's not above board and, and everything being done correctly. But mm. communication is key. I'm a yeah. big fan of communication. We've now, they dropped off for a few years, as I said, in the last council, but we picked them up again. We're now running them again. Mm. And putting all those people in the room together is good. And so what we did on Wednesday night this week was we had, and it's an open invitation, so mm. anyone that's involved in the community. So you had all industry, members of the community there from different walks of life? I wouldn't say all members of the community, but lots of different members of the community mm. there. Yeah. <laughs> but we give them an update, team. first of all, to mm. say what's happening with a range of projects that we think are having an impact on development. Mm. The Real Estate Institute, for example, so we had a representative from there to give us an update on what they're seeing. So mm. it's not just about what council's seeing. Mm. But one of the things I really enjoy the most is the questions at the end of it all just to see what's happening. And sometimes the answers will be given not by council but by people in the room. So there was some discussion around mm. different things happening there. One of the things that I found very exciting is that someone in the room said, well, I had a client the other day who approached me and said that they need 200 beds by end of the year, early next year. And when mm. I say 200 beds, I'm talking about not a motel. Mm. They need houses, flats, units, apartments, whatever form of accommodation yeah. for 200 people that this particular organisation will be bringing into the community in Dubbo. Wow. So those 200 beds can be made up of a three-bedroom house. There's yeah. three beds. Yeah. Or some um, apartments or units, that type of thing, where you've mm. got multiple beds in those, whatever it might be. And so the, the question was, you know, how am I going to do that? How am I going to deliver on that? Mm. What's the zoning? What's, what land is available, et cetera? But one of the things that I found exciting about that was I said, well, this is fantastic. We can give you the council answer around that. But I said, when we finish the Q&A and it's just time for people to talk, I guarantee that you've got other developers in the room yep. that are going to want to have a conversation with you yes. because ultimately you've got people in the room who can deliver yes. on this solution. That's it. So go and talk to the developers. Go yeah, and yeah. talk to people that own some land and see how you might deliver on that. But that's exciting. There's a client that needs 200 beds. Yep. That's obviously 200 people that are needed in our economy Absolutely. for whatever project. And yes. we didn't ask who the client was. It wasn't appropriate to ask no, that. No. And, I, and I wouldn't ask that. It's none of our business. But <laughs> you've got these opportunities. And yeah. putting developers together like that is a, a classic well, example. Say it's a classic example of the reason why these developers would be sitting back in interest going, wow, okay, I need to have a chat to you. Because yeah. if you're maybe struggling to get that, I think I might be able to help you with this. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. again, it's also good to get people in the room to understand the opportunities. I did say to people in the room, 
that we've got lots of activity in Dubbo. That's fantastic, mm. I said. But I think there's a fair bit of opportunity in Wellington. So for developers in the room that mm. want to go and look at where they might develop next, what the next project might be, mm. don't hesitate in looking at Wellington. You mightn't think mm. Wellington is well, exciting now. With the res in that's what so I'm talking about. That area, yeah, absolutely. yeah. So you might think, well, not much is happening in Wellington at the moment, and it's probably not right now. Mm. But developers usually have a bit of vision. Mm. So have a look at Wellington, see what opportunities are there. And then start to think about people wanting to travel five minutes to those projects rather than half an hour. Mm. Suddenly, you might wake up some huge opportunities in Wellington. I think mm. that will be where we'll see a transformation in Wellington. Did you find any um, any of the people in the room there were sort of uh, talking to council about any of the issues that they're currently facing? Were there any potential issues that, that some people there were sitting back saying, look, you know, you guys, can you help us out with this right now? The only – no, not really. The only thing we had was some – Feedback around Keswick, why isn't Keswick selling more? Why aren't you mm. selling more housing in Keswick? Why don't you drop the price in Keswick? Actually, that was an interesting discussion. Someone said, you've got houses, or you've got blocks of land, sorry, not houses, mm. in Keswick, council owns those, and they're not selling very well at the moment. You've got ones there to sell. Why don't you just drop the price, and then you'll get rid of them. That'll put some money into council's bank account, mm. and you can basically get more activity in the market. Mm. And I did say, I'm not trying to have council run a protection racket here for developers in the community. Mm. But I would be very concerned about a council that was in the development game. Some people argue council shouldn't be in the development game, but ignore that for the moment. Mm. We're in the development game. We own land that is being developed for residential housing. If we suddenly reduce the price of those houses by reducing the price of the land in the market, Mm. that has a huge negative impact on people in Dubbo, on Absolutely. house owners in Dubbo, yeah, yeah. It'd be on a real developers. Effect, wouldn't there? Absolutely right. So let's say, let's just pick round numbers. Let's say mm. we've got blocks of land at Keswick for $250,000 and we decide we want to get rid of them, generate more activity in the market, stimulate some activity. So we drop the price of those to $100,000. Mm. The first thing that happens is every person that's bought a house and land package recently, bought a new house recently, it really just knocked the value of their house down, yep. maybe not by 150000 but by a fair God, chunk. It would be significant, I'm sure. Absolutely. Then you've got other developers in Dubbo, and again, I'm not trying to run a protection racket, but no. they've invested money in blocks of land based yep. on a whole range of parameters and calculations they've done. They've gone and developed those blocks of land knowing what the housing market looked like approximately. Mm. So they might also be selling blocks of land for $250,000, which is the amount they need to sell it for to get back their initial investment and to yep. make some money along the way and all the rest of it. And then suddenly, if the market says 100000 is the price, well, they're either going to sit on that land mm. at two fifty and not sell it, because mm. why would someone buy some at two fifty when there's other ones mm. on there for 100 Now, it costs the money to hold on to that. There are holding costs associated with that. Yep. We're talking about people that have got loans of millions of dollars. Oh, absolutely, yes. The interest on that, as interest rates go up, is certainly yep. significant. So they either hold on to those, or they take a severe haircut and start yep. selling at $100,000. Now, the next time a developer, any developer... I know where this is leading, <laughs> because the whole idea of that would be... How could they then trust council to uh, to make a decision that they feel as though they're going to uh, continue on with for the future referencing of, of land and valuations? Correct. So if I'm a developer in the future, and some people frown on developers, oh no, rich, mm. greedy developers make lots of money. Well, the house that people are living in, they're sitting at home listening to this podcast, the house they're sitting in now, a developer had to be involved somewhere along the way That's right. for you to be able to live in that house there. So we need developers in the market. So if a developer looks at Dubbo and says, oh, hold on. That's that council that cut the bottom out of the housing market. Yes, yes. I'm not going All to invest my money. All for the sake of selling money. a few blocks a little bit faster. That's right. I'm mm. not going to invest my money in that community. I'm going mm. to go somewhere else where I've got more confidence. And a lot of this is confidence because mm. if I'm a developer and I see a parcel of land and I've got a vision, mm. I've got to go and buy that parcel of land. I'm going to go and spend typically millions of dollars on the parcel. Mm. Then I've got to put a bunch of infrastructure under the ground, stuff that no one can see. Mm. I've got stormwater pipes. I've got... Water pops, I've got to take water to these blocks. I've got sewerage. I've got power. I've got NBN. I've got all these services. I, I might not have gas because gas may not be yes, put into houses yes, anymore. But it. you've got all these services you've got to put into the land. I've got to do all the planning around the blocks of land. I've got to pay consultants to that. I've got to get mm. these all approved by council. There's so many steps along the way. Mm. It takes a long time. All the meanwhile, I've got this money, millions of dollars tied up. I could just have that. In a managed share investment, I can have that in the share market, in fixed interest loans. I'm making money on that on that money if I'm doing all that while I've got it in this land. Mm. 
and putting all these services in, it's costing me money. Mm. After all of that process, and I've done all my calculations, years down the track, if I've got it right, then I can start selling those blocks of land. And after I sell blocks of land, maybe I need to sell 80%, yes. 90%, whatever it's number It's always the blocks. last few that are probably going to make the real profit for Finally, them, finally. Yeah, yes. I've broken even on all that. I can start making money. Yes. Happy days. I'm finally in front there. Mm. So I have a lot of respect for developers that we need them in our Absolutely. community. And so you do all that, and then we come along at the last minute and cut the guts out of the market. Yeah, I don't think that would go down very well. I don't think it would go down very well. And not that they could do anything about it, mm. but again, future development in Dubbo would disappear. And we need development because people want to live here. We yeah. need that development Well, to these happen. figures are showing it, aren't they, too? 576 projected total of uh, when it comes to the building developments coming up in the next financial year, potentially. We're hoping that will be the case. So the developers must be very excited about seeing these sort of figures as well. Well, the feedback I got from the developers was that as much as they think they know what's going on, when they see a presentation about what's going on, they go, wow, there's some stuff going on. Yes. And so that's got to be good for anyone that wants to invest in Dubbo because yeah. it's about that confidence. Mm. If I invest that money today, am I going to get a return on that? Well, you don't know for sure. Mm. If you've got no confidence you're going to get a return, you're not going to invest. No, if you've got confidence, right. you're going to invest. Why do people put their money in to shares that they've got confidence in? Why do they put it into banks mm. that they've got confidence in? They want to have the mm. confidence that mm. that's going to give them a return. That's it. If someone rings up and says, I've got... Uh, an investment. It's called Shonky Deals Are Us. Can you just give us... <laughs> and I might change it too, by the that's way. That's right. I might change it last minute. <laughs> Can you give us all your hard-earned money and we'll invest it and we'll get a great return for you. You're mm. probably not going to feel that much confidence around that. So don't underestimate the value of confidence. Mm, that's right. Now, uh, during one of these committee meetings during the week there, Matt, one of the big points of discussion would have been the Duke of Wellington Bridge. This has been, uh, obviously, a, I suggest, a point of discussion for quite a while now since, of course, the, the floods went through and literally destroyed it. That We talked about this, I suggest, maybe two or three weeks ago in regards to uh, some of the potential planning um, the council now has to do in regards to how we're going to move forward from here. And we talked about some figures in regards to, you know, does council do nothing with it? Does council rebuild the bridge? Do we have to sort of, you know, reset up the uh, the area of the entrance point and restabilise those banks? What's happened here now? Has council made a decision in regards to how they're going to move forward? Well, keep in mind that committee meetings don't make resolutions of council. Have they made a recommendation? They have, indeed. Okay. And it's the next step. And so this is actually really good in terms of process. Mm. This is a big, complicated process we need to go through, the last thing you would want is for councillors getting their business papers, the community seeing business papers, and a few days later, you've got a council meeting and you make a decision mm. on a project of this size. We, in something this complicated, we have a process we go through. Mm. We have a workshop. We previously discussed it after we had a workshop. Yep. So that's a chance for us to talk about it. It's really the first viewing, if you like, mm. for councillors to get a look at it. Staff might have already been dealing with some consultants and had some discussions there. But we as councillors get to look at that, mm. grill the staff. It's a it's a private meeting. It's not streamed live to the public. So we can grill the staff. We can ask all the sorts of tough questions mm. or silly questions or whatever and really get ahead wrapped around it to a certain mm. extent. Mm. But remember, there's no decision made. Mm. A workshop is a discussion. A workshop is you and I having a discussion. Yeah. And if we decide no more needs to happen, that's the end of the discussion. If we decide something else needs to happen, then we go further. Mm. In this one, yes, we do think something needs to happen. Okay. So then it comes to a committee meeting. Now, the committee meetings give you more flexibility. The debate process is a little bit different. And so you get a chance to talk about that and make a recommendation. And then in another two weeks' time... Mm you'll have the council resolution. So we've kind of had three goes at getting mm. to the final conclusion and the public has had not so much a look at the workshop, but they've had a, a look at it now from a committee perspective and they can see which way councillors mm. are leaning from our recommendation and then you've got a couple of weeks to talk to councillors. So we're talking a lot of money here potentially. We're talking over $20 million. Correct. And this is the thing. The, the decision, if you remember from the workshop, we could do nothing. That might cost us about $50,000 mm -hmm. to do nothing. Mm -hmm. We could decommission the bridge, remove the structure altogether and do some bank stabilisation work. That would be about $23.4 million. Mm. We could decommission the bridge, retain the structure, and do some bank stabilisation works. That's about $21.4 million. Or reinstate the bridge and the road access and do the bridge stabilisation or the bank stabilisation works and fix up the road and stormwater reconstruction around mm. that area there. And that's about $21.6 million. Okay. So the three options of doing something all involve 
uh, number. Big dollars, over That's 20 right. million bucks. Uh, exactly. You're talking over 20 million for that. Yes. So the problem here is the bank stabilisation and the mm. do nothing option, as much as that sounds attractive from a cost perspective, if we do nothing, the Bell River is going to keep flowing down mm. there and it's still going to have to turn it's the corner. It's going to continue to erode, won't it, I'm sure. Correct. Yeah. And so you've got more roadway, you've got houses there, you've got to keep eroding mm. it. So I think we're going to have to do something. The recommendation from the actual committee to the council was that we target natural disaster funding to undertake the reinstatement works on the Bell River Riverbank mm-hmm. and then reinstate the Gabolian Street pavement and fix up the, the damage, okay. the stormwater damage, etc. So yep. basically take it back to its former glory as yep. it was end of last year before that last erosion there. Yep. So basically reinstate all that. So that's, that's about a $24 million costing? No, about 21.6, 21.6 of those. Okay. So it was actually a little bit yep. cheaper than removing the bridge, for example. Yep. So that's the process there. Now, we don't have that. Mm. We certainly don't have the budget for that. Our total budget for all of our roads across the whole LGA mm. is typically in the vicinity of about $30 million. Yeah, right. So $21.6 million on one project. You're not going to put it all in the one little pot. No, mm. that'd be tough. Mm. So we'll go out and target disaster recovery funding. Is, is there availability in this area? Does, it, does the state government uh, offer a lot of money? Like this sort of figure, we're talking a lot of money here. We are talking a lot of money, and there's not necessarily a program specifically that says, here's a program that's got this much money in it to target. Mm. The whole idea of disaster recovery funding is to get things back to the way they were, mm. but they'll still assess things pretty tightly when you're looking at And isn't there also of, the, the element of the essential that we talked about before? Yeah, so that's that's where we'll be working on, mm. and we're going to have to put together a good argument to get that across the line because the state government might say, well, you've got the other bridge, yeah. the main bridge there, you don't really need this bridge. Or they might also say, you knew about that erosion. The last council had that mm. way back in 2018. Mm. You should have done something about it beforehand. So there's a whole range of different arguments. We'll put our best foot forward and present an argument. I've already had a discussion with the Honourable Jenny Aitchison, okay. who's the Minister for Regional Transport and Roads. She happened to be in Dubbo last week. So it was a good opportunity to talk to Jenny and actually say, here's some things coming up. We haven't got a resolution of council yet, so Mm. I can't say to you formally that we'll be asking for this money, but Mm. it's likely that we're going to be asking for this money. So I just want to put it on your radar, make you aware of it, and really we'll talk to you more once we go down the path of actually doing it formally. So still at this stage, it's not formal yet. Right. We've got to wait for another two weeks for the council. There is the other element of all of this too is the fact that uh – just from what I'm gathering, listening to the, the media releases and reading the re- media releases and listening to the news, the current state government seems to be cutting back a, a lot of proposals and ideas that they, uh, when they came into government, uh, were set up as ideas for country communities in particular. What sort of faith do you have in regards to the fact that they might come through with the goods for this? It's one of those things that the disaster recovery, recovery funding process is there. Mm. I would hope that they would see this being an essential piece of infrastructure for the community. And this isn't just about the Wellington community Mm. because people come through Wellington, coming to Dubbo, coming to places further west of Dubbo. Mm. Yes, we've got the main bridge crossing there. But if something happens there, Mm. now we have seen something happen there once before, but if something else happened there, it's hard to get through Wellington to Mm. get out past west of Wellington. Having two places to cross the Macquarie River in Wellington make sense. And it also takes a bit of pressure off the highway there because people who need to get from some parts to other parts in Wellington can go via mm. that low-level bridge. Mm. So I think, to me, it would be disappointing. I, I hear mm. what you're saying. That the state government is looking at a lot of things. The workplace hub we already talked about mm. there. They're cutting back on that, unfortunately. So they are cutting back a lot of programs, mm. but I'd be disappointed if they cut back that disaster recovery funding process. Mm. Now, speaking of bridges, uh, one of the points of discussion seems to be uh, amongst the community this week, I've noticed, is that regards to the proposed South Bridge, which is another bridge. We've got the the new Dubbo Bridge, which is currently under construction. So this is going to be a newer Dubbo Bridge. (laughs) The South Dubbo Bridge is probably the way that most people like to refer to it as. So has there been more discussion around this? Yeah, you're absolutely spot on. And it is funny... I still laugh at the Transport Minister of Wales name of, of the new Dubbo Bridge. That's right, yes. And I, I have <laughs> said, how long is it the new Dubbo Bridge until it's the not-so-new Dubbo Bridge? Until this bridge maybe comes in. Well, and, and maybe you're right. right. Maybe it's the new until another bridge comes That's along. That's right, yeah. And now it's the 
not as new as the South Dover Bridge. That's right. Bridge. We've got a newer one now. Yeah, that's right. So <laughs> anyway, we, we are funny in the way we name things. So this goes way back to August 2019. Mm. And at that time, council received $100,000 from the New South Wales government. And the idea there was to investigate a bridge crossing south of the Late Ford Bridge. So mm. caught the South Dover Bridge. It's south this, of the Lake Bridge. The main aim of this was it to take congestion off West Dubbo? The main aim of this is to, to serve local traffic mm. and not use the LH Ford for people that need to get from West Dubbo, from some of those explosion areas mm. there that we're seeing as you go up Manor Road. There's lots of extra areas there where people yes. will be living. And some of those people don't need to go to the CBD. They don't need to go across mm. the Cerusia Bridge or the LH Ford Bridge. They need to be down around the South Dubbo area, mm. for example. Mm. So the idea was to investigate that. Council back then engaged a company called GHD, and they did a strategic concept design. Now, you may remember reading something in the papers at the time. They had some bridges there, and there was a bit of controversy over it because some people weren't happy about where that traffic would go. Mm. And I think it got a bit too hot for that council, and they mm. just left it. Mm. Now, one of the things that councils should do across the state, across the nation, is they should be doing strategic planning. Mm. It's not about things we're going to do today. Yes, it is, yep. of course, about that as well. But it really should be about things you're doing mm. five years, ten years, one twenty years. One eye in the present, one eye in the future. Exactly mm. right. And and council is the logical body mm. to be doing that long-term strategic planning. So this council has said there was a bit of a gap in strategy, mm-hmm. there was probably the ball was dropped severely in terms of strategic thinking in the mm. last council. Because it did get off the conversation radar, didn't it, for a long while? It did. And you really need to be having those conversations mm. and you need to be doing all of the strategic planning as well as doing the things that fix the potholes today, plan the roads of tomorrow. You mm. really need to be doing all of that. Mm. So we've gone back and looked at it now. Now, there were four basic options okay. that were put forward in that report. We've essentially ruled out two of those options. And they basically would be going through some of the sporting fields around Lady Cutler, creating a lot of traffic around there. Mm. So they didn't seem appropriate. The two options that we're left with that we think would be logical, sensible in some way, shape or form are two options that both go into Tamworth Street, so join up to Tamworth Street, and where they come across the other side of the river would either be at Manor Road. Right. So if you think about Manor so Road. across a bit of an angle there, is it? Yeah. Well, you'd go straight across the highway at yeah. the North Road, and then you come down and, and loop around, if you like, there's probably be a bit of a curve in the road there. Yeah. Or the other option would be where the entrance to the golf club is at the moment, having an intersection somewhere there, taking a, a road and a bridge across the river, right. and then joining back up. So would this traffic then feed up Tamworth Street, or would it be sort of directed off at, uh, say, Macquarie Street there? It'd go up into Tamworth Street and then there'd be some sort of treatment, I can't tell you exactly what it would look Mm. like at this stage, where traffic would be encouraged in a variety of ways. It might even be blocked off Mm. where you'd turn left or right at Macquarie Street rather than go straight up. Mm. You might actually have a a barrier there that would allow people to come down Tamworth Street Mm -hmm. and turn left or right. So have some sort of barrier there. Or even maybe come down Tamworth Street and go straight across if you're going down to the sporting area down Mm. there, down around the the Tamworth Street Bridge, some of those areas there. But if you're going back up, you Mm. might not have the option to go straight up Tamworth Street, for example. So the the aim be to try to to connect up to one of those more, uh, well, let's refer to them as the thoroughfare type roads. The Macquarie Macquarie Street is probably the most obvious one. Yeah, that's right. Now, take, for example, some of the population that might live over in West Dubbo, again, Mm. all that population that's all there already and and will continue to grow. Let's say you're living around there, around Manor Road, around the golf course, even Kintyre, some of those areas there, and you've got students at... Sheraton Road, so Mm. Christian School, St. John's College, St. John's Primary, some of those schools up around there, for example, you might have, and again, this is this long-term strategic planning, this Mm. is not going to happen tomorrow, you might come down Manor and go across, if that's where the bridge goes, or you might turn right onto the highway and go across there at the golf club, you might come across there, feet up into Tamworth, turn right on Macquarie Street, Mm. go around Macquarie Street, which is more a thoroughfare, as you said, Mm. more a distributor road, Mm. and then our plan as well is to have a southern distributor. So as you go out along Macquarie Street, goes to Old Dubber Road, and then it goes down around and where Wheelers Lane, you turn left there, rather oh, yes. than turning left, yep. you'd keep going straight there through, again, we're calling this our southern distributor road. It doesn't exist at the moment. Yep. We've got some plans for a southern distributor that would then go around at a potentially higher speed, it might be a 70k zone, for example, yep. go around and loop around and then join up eventually with Sheraton Road. Oh, yes. Yep. That might be 
a faster way for you mm. to get from West Dubbo to Sheraton Road then, and it might be slightly longer distance, mm. but you could probably flow at a good 60 or 70 k's along the way mm. rather than going LH Ford Bridge up the highway, multiple traffic lights as you go, congestion, mm. particularly in the morning, mm. for example, or even the evening, but you get a lot of congestion up there. So take that traffic off there. It's better for that congestion mm. up the middle, but also mm. it might distribute that around. Do either of these options you're talking about here, are they going to affect uh, any of the, the current public fields or planning for public fields or even the walkway that's down there right now in regards to around the river? Well, the walkway that's there, you would typically see this bridge, and the detailed plans aren't there yet. This is mm. really concept plans at this stage. But that walkway, the bridge, the new bridge, newer bridge, newest that's right. bridge, that's right. would be just slightly south of the walkway. Mm, and okay. so then we've got this wonderful track of Riley loop that people go on. Yes. I would imagine, again, this isn't the gospel, this isn't a mm. concrete plan, this is just my estimation at this stage. Mm. I would estimate that as you came along the barbecue area there at Regan Park, yes. if you're walking along the walkway there, the bridge might be somewhere along there, and I'd imagine the walkway would probably go underneath the bridge Probably in a similar way that you go underneath oh, yeah. the Sarissia Bridge. Yeah, yeah. Yep. It wouldn't be, this bridge wouldn't be as high as the LH Ford Bridge. It wouldn't be above the 1 in 100 year flooding level, for Would example. It would be more like the Sarissia Bridge. It would be more like the Sarissia Bridge, that's okay. right. So in flooding times, you probably, depending how high the flood is, you probably wouldn't be able to use this bridge, mm. but it would still, so it'd be a bit lower to the ground, but mm. you'd still want people to be able to walk around there mm. and not have to go across a busy road. So again, you, the, the main aim of this bridge is more about congestion and moving people around faster from the West Dubbo coming off that main run, swinging it around into Dubbo or off those areas that aren't necessarily heading into the CBD space. Yeah, that's right. And some of them might go to the CBD, but mm. they might also go LH4 or through if they're going into the CBD. So it yeah. probably would be that other distributor-type traffic there. Yeah. So the, the two projects or the two concepts there, as I said, off the Nor Road or off the golf club entrance there, you're talking about an estimated cost for the one off Manor being around about $39 million mm -hmm. and the one off the golf club about $32 million. Okay. So again, this is not the kind of money that we've got sitting around in loose State change. State government funding again? Federal government funding? Uh, that'd be, And this one probably would more be potentially federal okay. and, and maybe some state mm. or vice versa. We'll take it from anywhere. Yeah. The idea would be at this stage that we prepare a detailed business case on the alignment around option two and option three. So we've got some rough concept ideas from GHD, go out there, do a more detailed business case, and then ultimately, after more information, after more traffic surveys, traffic studies, mm -hmm. where are these cars going, mm -hmm. more of that data, yeah. refine that. Now that we're refining the actual path of the bridge, get more data, come back with a business case, go at public consultation, mm. and then get to a point where we finally make a decision to say, this is going to be the option. Mm. It's going to be off Manor or off the golf club entrance there. This and then is you start to, to seek like, the funding after that? Correct. And then yep. we'd have, here's our option, here's what we've gone out with public consultation, here's where council has mm. made a decision, yeah. and now we've got a cost, 39, 32, whatever the cost might be, mm. let's now go out and start getting government funding. So if you said to me, what time frame will we see this bridge built, mm. I would not see this bridge being built for five years. Yeah, right. Okay. And and that even five years would probably be ambitious. So mm. again, this is where But it's you the need planning be, process, isn't it? It's that's all about right. the strategic plan. You need to be putting these strategic plans in place. So mm. to give you an idea, we'll go out and do the business case. Then we'll come back, then we'll go out public consultation. We'll mm. talk about it more. We'll look at some more plans. We'll go through that and eventually we'll decide on a path. Mm. And then the funding process, that's not a five-minute process, so that takes some time. Mm. And then once we get all that done, you've got to build it. Mm. So, uh, I, again, I don't think absolutely there's no way I can see it being built within the next five years. Yes. Ten years, yeah, maybe. Mm. So mm. this is the sort of time frame we're talking about for this But it's a discussion bridge. that needs to be happening now, so that you, you're planning it out there for the, the potential growth of our city, of course, and, and what our needs are. You hit the nail on the head. We're planning for it now. That's the critical part of mm. all this. This interesting little one here, Matt, uh, one of the committee meetings there. The audit of signs across the urban areas of the LGA. Now, auditing of signs, are we talking stop signs, give way signs, like uh, we counting how many we've got? Like what sort of auditing and what signs are we talking about here? Well, we're really talking about signs that council owns right. more so than 
state government signs. So things like traffic lights, things yes. like stop signs on, on those roads. That's all they would, state? Well, typically be. Some might be mm-hmm. ours, but typically they would be the, involved with that particular road. So traffic lights yep. on a highway would obviously be the transport from New South Wales. So we're talking government. commemorative signs. We're, we're really talking any signs. Right. And it all started from a, a, a bit of a fluke where I happened to be at one particular location, or I'll say where it is, I was up at DCFM. Yes. And I... Shout out, there you go. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and I finished an interview there with DCFM, and then after the interview, I went to, there's a, a vacant field there, it's a an easement as far as mm. I know, and I went to go from there, and I was turning around that easement, and I saw a sign, and the sign was very out of date. Right. And it had incorrect information on there. Went, oh, oh, those classic old signs sort of sitting there, weathered away, yep. rusting up, that sort of thing. Yes, I know the ones. And I thought, that's a bit annoying. We should get that fixed up. Mm. And I just happened to be having a casual conversation with our Deputy Mayor, Richard Ivey. Mm. And I said, oh, I saw this on there. We've got to do something about that. And he saw, he said, I've actually seen a few like that mm. in Wellington as well. He said, well, we should fix those. I said, well, that's a good idea. And mm. then Richard came up with the idea, well, let's have a bit of an audit mm. of our signs across the LGA, which makes complete yeah. sense. Because at some point in time, there was an official ceremony would have been held and there would have been a very important reason why most of these signs were put there to obviously commemorate or to recognise or whatever the case was at the time. Exactly right. And in some cases, they're out of date. So mm. well, I'll, I'll tell you a bit of the, the summary first. There were 549 signs that were inspected. So our staff did well to inspect yeah, what these I'm impressed signs. about by that. They actually found these signs. That's right. Because <laughs> some of them are incredibly obscure places, I'm sure. That's right. So they looked at 549 signs. Of those, they found 265, which had some problem. Okay. Now. Jeez, that's only half. That is. Now, there's more than 549 signs. Mm. And in some areas, when they would drive along and they'd see a sign, they didn't mm. stop and record every sign because that one's right, that one's right, that one's right. Mm. Ones that were of more significance, I suppose, mm. is what they looked at. Was there a database for them to help this out, or did they just have to simply just drive around town trying to find signs? They did do that, and that's exactly what will come as a result of this, oh. is that we'll create some form of database, some Excellent. sort of asset register yeah. to have these signs there so that we've got that information in the future. And so one thing that was interesting is that there were some signs that he- there had – Wellington Shire Council or WC Council. Mm. Probably not the absolute end of the world, and you wouldn't want to spend a huge amount of money just changing Change the logo. logo. Mm. Yes, it's been seven years since the amalgamation. They have changed some things, but normally you'd probably do that. For example, our cars. Mm. I, I hope we didn't go and replace all the stickers on all our cars as soon as we had the amalgamation. Mm. But as you transition the cars over, as you replace those cars, would be the logical mm. time to do that. Mm. So there are things like that. So there were the examples that basically had that on there. Mm. There were other examples where there was incorrect information. There were some still signed by by order of A.G. Kelly, mm. General Manager of Dubbo oh, City Council. A, Tony signatures everywhere. There it is. That's right. And so, again, that for whatever reason was a practice at some stage to put the general manager's name on there. Yes, right. Now, Tony's passed away. Tony was a great mm. general manager for council. Mm, absolutely. Oh, I think 2004 he retired. So mm. some of those signs are fairly out of date. Again, is that the end of the world? Well, I actually question whether or not that's a legal sign now. Mm. It's not by order of A.G. Kelly. It's not mm. by order of a general manager. We don't have a general manager anymore. Mm. And it's not by order of WC City Council. So if someone was going to be fined based on that sign, mm. is it legal? So maybe we did need to fix mm. up some of those type of signs. We found other signs. There were some parking signs, for example. And one I found in, in the report was, was interesting. It said in one particular area, loading zone, 7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. Monday to Friday. On the same sign essentially pointing, well, no, it is pointing the same direction. It mm. says one-hour parking, 12.30 p.m. to 6 p.m. Monday to Friday. Oh, okay, so when do you do the loading or when so do you do the parking? I turned up there <laughs> at 12.30. Well, I'm in a loading zone and I'm in a one-hour parking zone. Mm. Which one is it? Which one because the other one? That's right. So that one obviously needs to be fixed up in yes. the short term. I saw other ones. You've got down the LH Ford Bridge, for example. Beside that, mm. the original bridge that was a crossing across the river there was a bridge called the White Bridge. Now, we're really Original good. name, wasn't it? We're really yes. good at naming that we uh, Some expert, they brought, hired a yep. consultant, I'm sure. That's right, right. What are we going to name this bridge? It's White and it's a bridge. Okay, I'll, I'll go away. I'll do some focus groups. I'll, I'll work <laughs> Bring on some that. some consultants. What do That's you think, right. guys? <laughs> and then we'll come back and we'll name it the White Bridge. Well it's, done again. It's better than the new bridge. That's true. Only <laughs> slightly so, but better. <laughs> but the problem with the sign for the White Bridge, which is an historical bridge, the bridge mm. isn't there anymore, but there's yeah. a, a spot where that bridge joined into the riverbank. Yeah. We've actually got the Height Ridge. 
because oh. the W and the B have fallen off that <laughs> sign. <laughs> so we've got the height nice, ridge. Nice. So it's ones like that. If someone's going around Trekker Riley, and that's on Trekker Riley, yes. then some of those type of signs obviously need to be fixed up. So as a result of all of that, a couple of things. <laughs> the first thing is that we've actually had a project to replace some of the signs around the Trekker Riley cycleway. So it's okay. a, a wayfinding project yeah. that we've been doing around there. We're at the point now that we've basically got the designs done. We're about to go out to tender. So that will fix up some of those mistakes, some of those signs. So are they, they're prioritising the changeover, are they? Is that the plan? Not so much prioritising the changeover. That was something that was already, already happening. Okay. The rest of the signs, now that we've done this audit, mm. what we'll actually do is go through now and put those into our budget. We don't have budget, any money in our budget mm. this year to do it. Any ones that we found there that need to be fixed up, like that parking sign mm. that I talked about, then definitely some of those will be fixed up in the short term, because that's just plain wrong. Yep. Some ones like logos, if the sign's worn out, they'll be budgeted for in future times, mm. and again, they'll be fixed up and repaired as time goes on. But if you see one that looks wrong, don't hesitate. Report it through to our staff. Report it to council, because you need to fix those ones up, obviously, Absolutely. and yeah. we'll go through and do that. But, but good you don't idea. know if it's going to be a loading zone or a parking area for you. That's a pretty essential thing to know. That's exactly right. But good idea from Councillor Ivy to bring that one forward. I think that's important. And again, it's just making sure the community looks good, looks presentable, and yes. looks good for visitors that come Absolutely. through. A response to the notice of motion in regards to drought security projects. This was also part of the um, the discussion at one of the committee meetings during the week. Matt, where uh, if you're listening to, I'm sure you are as well, like I am. A uh, bit of interest. Uh, the El Nino effect is apparently kicking back in again here. And look, this potentially could mean us moving into another drought uh, scenario. Are we ready for it? Uh, are we prepared for it? Uh, are we any better placed than than the last drought when it comes to water in particular? We are better placed compared to last drought, but I mm. wouldn't say that we're ready for it okay. yet. And the problem we have here is that we've got water that we use in our water treatment plant. We've got three water treatment plants. We've got one in Wellington, one in Geary, one in Dubbo. Mm. If we look at the one in Dubbo just for a moment, just focus on that just briefly, mm. we've got a couple of things there. We've got surface water. So that's the Macquarie River that right, we use. Right. And we've got groundwater, which is typically bores that we use for that. Okay. Now, yep. that mixture has changed. Way back in my early days on council, I think we used to do about a 50-50 shandy. Oh, really? And the state government at one stage said, you're taking a fair bit of water out of the bores. Mm. That might be affecting the level of those bores. Can you just cut back a little bit? Mm. We had a license to do whatever we needed to do then because we weren't going over our license. Mm. But the reality was, can you just cut back? So we cut back, and I think from memory back in those days, it might have been a 30, 70 shandy, so about 30% from the bores, about 70% from the river. Mm. And even now, we're probably back to a, a 20 or 25% okay. so, from the so bores. So we, we still access bores even today? We do. We do access bores. Okay. And there's a few reasons we do that. It does take a little bit of pressure off the river, but it mm. also makes sure that all our equipment we've got is still operating and, and keep that water going and flowing mm. through there. And the bores seem to recharge quite well. Mm. We've got licences, so we've got licences to take water from the river. We've got licences to take water from bores. Do we have an unlimited licence in regards to that to take up in whatever water we need? Our licensing is no different to any licensing that a farmer might have. Okay. We have to buy licenses on the open market. We don't have compulsory acquisition powers like we might have with land. If we right. need water, we need to go to the market and buy that water at whatever the market price is. So we is. can't give up a, a farmer or a cotton grouping or whatever the case may be out there. It's, Dubbo's got larger priority. We would sort of think that's the case, but we don't have that. And it makes sense that we would have some ability mm. to do that because we might say we've got to have a population of tens of thousands of people that need to be able to turn on the tap for drinking water. Mm. And a cotton farmer can say, I need to grow my cotton crop and I've got water that I can use for that. So I'm going to do that. Thanks very much. Mm. One thing, and I didn't know this until we had the meeting on Thursday night, but one of the staff told us about when the last drought was on, yep. the geniuses that we had in charge of council said, let's go out and ask the community if anyone out there wants to give us some of their water allocation maybe cheap or maybe give it to council for the good of the community. Pretty sure that would have been a one of those sort of fallen on deaf ears sort of moments. Well, they had lots of approaches from people in the community to sell them some mm. of their water licences or to lease them some temporary, mm. if you able, very much at market rates or way yep. above market rates. Yep. So no one came forward There's no and no one giving it away. No one was going to give it mm. away. And to be fair to those people, that's their business. If, if 
you have water licenses as part of your business, whether you be a farmer, some people will trade it. This is your opportunity in drought times. Yeah. This is your opportunity to make some money out of this. Make one. hay while sun shines. Excuse me. So it literally is a pun. commodity. It is a commodity. It's a yeah. tradable commodity. Mm. So we don't have any extra powers. We have to buy licenses, and that's what does we. Does that money only apply on. to river, or does that apply to the bores as well? Both. Both. Yeah, okay. that's exactly right. Now, to give you an idea, I think people might be interested in how much water we do use in mm. terms of the, the overall water, mm. and I'm just focusing here now on Dubbo City, because I go back before the amalgamation, mm. and if I look at some of the big years that we've had in water usage, we talk about 10.5 gigalitres, 10,500 megalitres, mm. and so 10.5 gigs we used back in the 2004-05 financial year. So that would have been a drought year? Yes, and 6-7 was dry as well, 2006-7, mm. 10.5 gigalitres, mm. and then in 2017-18, we used 10.5 gigs as well. Oh, really? Yeah, so, so I twelve thought, years later, whatever it was, that we were still using the same amount of water in in again a dry year. Now I yeah, thought yeah. it might have gone through into the nineteen year, but it seemed to be the the drought must have been not that bad in that nineteen mm. twenty year, or even the eighteen nineteen year. So we used ten or are we just getting there. better at conserving water. We might have been, and there were some restrictions on water then at the same time. Mm. Uh, two thousand and three four, we used ten point two gigs. Two thousand and two three, ten point two gigs as well. So. That early 2000s, that was certainly yeah. a dry time. Can there. I just ask you a question in regards to that? Because there's something that has always been bandied about here in Dubbo that um, it gets mentioned a lot. You know, when it comes down to these times of drought and council starts putting water restrictions on, now there's always been this argument, we don't need water restrictions in Dubbo, we've got plenty of water. True or false? We didn't need to have the water restrictions that we had the last time council put them on. In fact, they actually went against, against council policy. Oh. The main thing that you would do to create policy is do it when you're not in the time of extreme stress. Mm. So there was a policy that council had in place that said, here are the triggers for when we should go to various levels of water restrictions. So those triggers were put in place in times when you weren't mm. in stress, you didn't have drought, you didn't need to have all those restrictions in place. Mm. So Thinking about it in a good, calm environment, here are the various triggers. Mm. And the the last council went to the extreme high level of water restrictions, which was way over and above mm. all of those other triggers that they had in place there. Yeah, right. And one of the things that we do have in Dubbo is, yes, we've got some bores, which I'll get to those in a minute. Mm. So we've got the ability to take some water from some bores. But the other thing we've got is a very large weir pool. Mm. Now, the weir, the South Dubbo weir, was built back in the 1930s. There's this wonderful wow. picture there that I've seen of the weir when there was a dry face downstream mm. of the weir when they were constructing the weir and the whole weir being constructed there and that was put in for water security. Mm. Now, I know when we had some very unfortunate deaths at mm. the weir, we've had some over the years and a horrible situation yes. for someone to die in our community at any time, but I sat through one of the coronial inquiries there, very tough couple of days, but nowhere near as tough as the people who had lost... As uh, children had, going, yes. Yeah, right, had, yes. had loved ones that were lost. So, yeah. it, obviously, terrible traumatic time for them, and, and uh, you know, I, I feel for, for them all the time when I think mm. about that weir. But one of the things I talked about to Stuart McLeod, who was the engineer at the time, said the whole idea of this weir pool, having a weir there and having the pool back, is to give us some sort of security over water. Mm. And I said, okay, so there's a certain volume of water there. Could we do something else? Let's think left field, for example, and dig a big hole just before where the weir is and get rid of the weir altogether mm. so that you've got this water that's flowing like along. Like a natural pooling effect. Yeah, that's right. Yep. So they had this huge pool mm. that has enough water to keep us going in that time. And we did a couple of very rough back-of-the-envelope calculations. Mm. But the problem or the advantage we have with that weir is that just say, for example, you build a weir up a metre higher than where the water would normally be in that river. That's a metre height of water and then that goes back up the river mm. for kilometres. Mm. So when you're talking about a volume of water, you're talking about the width of the river yep. multiplied by the height you get with that weir multiplied by the length. I mean, mm. it's just a simple volume equation. Yes. So that's a huge number. Absolutely. You're not going to go and dig a hole that's kilometres deep no, just for no. a weir pool. Yep. So in the end, the decision was made by council back when we were doing the work on the rocks that we put downstream of that. That was done around 2016. Yep. The decision was made that, yes, we still needed the weir for water security mm. for Dubbo. Now, if Burundong Dam stops flowing, now remember a few years ago it got down to 1%. Yes. If it stops flowing, 
we've still got that weir pool, and when the water stops flowing over the weir, for example, mm. you've still got that weir pool backed up. So I don't know, I can't tell you how many months of water we've got in that weir mm. pool, but you could keep, and you might restrict water a little bit for people if you got to that point where that was that bad. But the other thing is the dead water in Burundong Dam. So the water that's below the level of the water that can flow out of the dam when you open the gates mm. is about... 22 gigalitres. Okay. Now, I've talked yeah, right. about here in yep. extreme dry years that we as a community might Using use 10. 10. Yeah. yeah. So the water, if the water is completely empty, I say 1% in the mm. dam, mm. and you get no more water flow for the next year, yeah. you've still got 22 gigs. Now, keep in mind that if you pump that 22 gigs out of the dam and put it into the river, you don't get all 22 gigs down here because you get some evaporation and yes. some might soak into the river, into the river banks, et cetera. So you're still going to get a fair chunk of that. I'm sure yep. someone would know those calculations. But this is where the bores come in handy for us, isn't it? That's right. So we can run the bores, mm. run them suddenly if we had limited water in the river, run those bores, do them at their maximum license, and then take minimal from the river to mm. extend that. So we didn't need to go into the water restrictions we did last time. Mm. It was sensible to go into some sort of water restrictions because it made sense. But again, one of the competitive advantages that we've got in Dubbo mm. is we as a community have invested a lot of money in a water treatment plant, yep. in licenses, water licenses, etc., so that we give people confidence in the community that we're mm. going to have water. If I'm living in Sydney, I've yep. got lots of water, and someone says, move out to Dubbo, oh, I'm not going there, mm. I hear they have water restrictions. And then, to make it worse, one of my great frustrations, one of the first things that we changed when we got the new council on board, mm. was at each entrance to the city, we had a big sign up mm. that said, current level of water restrictions. Yep. It didn't have any part that said, no water restrictions. No. It had water restrictions, one, two, three, four, five, whatever mm. it might have been on there. Yep. So I'm driving on the highway, I get to Dubbo, and I see this big sign at the entrance that says level five, I go, yep. oh, well, I'm going to continue on, I can't That's have a it. share at the motel. That's right. Now- you start to think about that. When we have water restrictions, who are we appealing to? Mm. Who are we trying to inform about that? And who can make a difference to the amount of water you're going to use? Mm. It's the residents of Dubbo. It's mm. not people driving in on the highways. It's not people staying at motels. Mm. The amount of difference they make is minimal. Mm. We typically use over 30% of our water in our gardens. So the obvious way to restrict water is to talk to the residents, yes. not put big signs up and advertise that we're back water, hick town that doesn't even have enough water for us. I mean, that was the worst mm. advertising you Absolutely. could ever do. The worst yeah. PR you could ever do for a community is to put a big sign up to say, this is Watch not out. a sophisticated... No showers here for the, the time oh, being. Where just, we go? Yeah, we are not a modern, sophisticated city. We're a little backwater yeah. hick town. Move on up the highway. That's right. And, and now, certainly... Now, no restrictions, apparently. That's they are. right. <laughs> certainly, we saw evidence of people saying that they did yeah. drive through Dubbo and forget about it. Hey, so, listen, you, you asked... We talked about it at the start of the, our discussion in regards to... Um, I asked you about, uh, are we ready for the next drought? And you sort of said, we're not quite there. So what are we going to do? What, what's, what are some of the things that we have to sort of try to get in place? Now, we were given $30 million by the last government okay. to try and create some more drought resilience. And that was the whole point of this particular question that came to council was, mm. what have we done? How are we going with it? And so we've spent some money on some more bores. And typically when you're okay. buying a bore, you're not buying the bore per se, you're buying the bore license, but mm. you're typically taking it from so that's the that's the main thing we need to be doing right now is securing more bores. Securing more bores, there was talk at one stage of building a pipeline from Baranong Dam to the water treatment plant here in Dubbo. Wow, that's, that's quite a process though, isn't it? That is a process. And the idea of that is just to reduce evaporation and losses along mm. the water. So that hasn't been a project we've gone ahead with at this stage. Mm. But certainly more bores. And then you need pipelines from those bores to get that water to the water treatment plant. Right. So we've, we've done that. And we're at the stage now where we've got approximately three gigs of availability of water from our bores. Okay. So again, if I look at, I talked about those maximum water usages, in the minimum years, Dubbo uses around six gigs of water. So you still would want to get up to around six gigs, and that's in a wet year when people aren't watering their gardens as much, yeah. obviously. So if you look at 11, 12, 21, 22, 20, 2021, 2022, which kind of makes sense because it was pretty wet that year, yeah. 6.2 gigs we used, 
2010-11, we used 6.5. 2020, 2021, mm. we used 6.9 gigs. So in a good wet year, mm. we're using around that six, maybe up to seven gigs of and water. And so during the droughts, you mentioned there about the fact we do this 80-20 split, a roundabout sort of thing, where 80% from the river, 20% from the bores. Well, that's normal, not, not that's droughts. That's a normal that, sort of time. That's just normal time frame. During the droughts, we change that up? Well, we can do that. Obviously, we can increase the amount we take from our bores, and depending how much water you need, yeah. you might increase that and get that up. Obviously, on those six gig years, you could get up around 50% again. Yeah, right. Okay. And again, I'm focusing on Dubbo City water supply here rather than the three mm. water supplies. Mm. So we had the $30 million. We've spent some of that. We actually put a new bore in down at Wellington as well. So okay. we, we've got yeah. better access to bores there in Wellington. But that being a bit closer to the dam, you're probably going to have a little bit better access to mm. water down there as well from mm. the river. The idea is that we want to get up to the point where we could possibly get a hundred percent of our water supply from the bores, or very close to that, that mm. would put us if in we a had very to sort of thing. Is that right? That's we, we'd like to get there, but that's mm. expensive. And of course, as we know, uh, again, the, the last group of councillors spent five million dollars on a purple pipeline that goes nowhere. Oh, really? So that five million dollars, if you remember, we've had that discussion before, was mm. built to take water from the sewage treatment plant to the uh, around the field or even back into the yep. water treatment plant, but even just to water the fields down there yep. to save our potable water. But, of course, they didn't get permission from the EPA to use that water. Oh, no. And when that's the right. pipeline was finished, now. that's yes. right, and then can we use that water? No, that water is not treated to a high enough standard oh, to no. put on sporting fields over mm. the top of underground water. So that was five of the 30 that was allocated. That was five of the 30 mm. that was wasted. So that could have been used for more bores. Okay. But we'll keep chipping away. We've spent most of that $30 million now, and again, okay. we're up to that three gigs. We'll keep working on that. Mm. The bottom line is, if we had a severe drought like we had a few years ago, we still, based on our current policies, wouldn't need to necessarily go into water restrictions. You might go on to a low level of water restriction just to make sure we can extend that water out for as long as possible. Mm. But we want to get to the stage where we can give people confidence when they're moving to Dubbo and our population is growing as well, yeah. that you're not going to have these water restrictions on a regular basis, again, that's our competitive advantage. Absolutely. When you're looking at moving to Dubbo or other locations, one of the factors you should consider is, can I keep having water yes. that's going to flow in my taps, put on my garden, whatever it might be? And a lot of people talked to me during those water restrictions. Again, I wasn't mm. on council at that time, mm. but they said they spent a lot of money on their garden. Mm. They think Dubbo looks beautiful with all these beautiful gardens. Do we really want to destroy the whole mm. appeal of Dubbo? Based on these, when we didn't need to, based mm. on those severe water restrictions. So we're getting there. A good project to keep working on. We'll keep working through that Absolutely. project. Absolutely. Ah, this would have been. Want well, to make the official opening of the three D printed toilet block? Now I know we've spoken at length about this uh, in regards to three D printed water uh, toilet block. We don't have to go back over and discuss ins and outs of that anymore. But uh, during the week there was the official opening, which is good. And it looks as though there's been a little bit of interest from other councils around the state as well. So what's happened here? Lots of interest in a whole range of things. Now, here's the critical question for you. Mm. What do you cut when you're opening a toilet block? I thought it would have been appropriate to have toilet paper. I was just about to say, did you roll out uh, a bit of the old Kleenex uh, best of? It, it would have seemed appropriate to me. I thought that was perfect. Mm-hmm. It, Double strength? It, it didn't seem appropriate for some of the people that I was suggesting it to. So we didn't <laughs> We didn't have they toilet a nice paper. nice red ribbon, did they? Well, we didn't do a ribbon in the end. There was no ribbon. It, there was no. It was. It was decided. Isn't that the whole point of an opening? Is to have a ribbon. Well, I, I thought. Well, I thought the toilet paper was a good idea, but yeah. some other people didn't think it was such a good idea. <laughs> um, so we just did the opening. No we, sense of humour. Some people. That's don't right. You? We opened the door on the toilets. Was the official opening. So wow, that'd have been exciting. Yeah, that's right. So, that was. <laughs> but what we will do is we will have a plaque. There's no plaque on there at this stage, but right. we will have a plaque on there that that commemorates the opening. That's all part of it. But we're going to have a QR code on that plaque that will go to a video that shows the time lapse of the construction. And just oh, a bit more information about the construction because it's a good idea. There is no doubt in my mind that this will be another thing people will visit in Dubbo. Mm. And I know people are laughing already at me mm. saying, Oh, that's a crazy idea. People are doing it already. Yeah, yeah. And we've had people with a bit of interest in it. So we've had architectural firms who have come up and inspected the oh, toilet wow. block. Yeah, right. We had a minister who was in town recently who said, I've heard about this 3D printer toilet. I've got to go and have a look at that. I'll go there before I head out to the airport. I'll just to drop in. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> had a look at that to see this 3D yeah, printer right. process. Yeah. We've had our staff have been approached by 10 other councils for not just a quick phone call, hey, I heard you did this 3D yeah. printer toilet. It was, can you give me the details? How did it go? How right? did it operate? So there's been 10 other councils already have uh, shown a significant amount of interest. That's across the state, 10 other councils wow. that have said, can you tell me more about that? Yep. We've had 
some of the media calls I've had have been mm. across the state, different areas across the state have been talking to me from a media perspective. Mm. And one of the things that we had another discussion during the week was you may remember that when we first made the announcement that we would reserved four blocks of land in a future housing estate for 3D printed houses yes. specifically. Yes. And we had a lot of interest. I, I can't remember, maybe eight or nine companies from around the world. There was yes. one from Singapore, I remember, companies across Australia who contacted us. We had some video calls with these mm. companies. They wanted to know all about it, how they could get into it. Mm. We put the tender out for the 3D printer toilets. We got some tenders came in and mm. we chose Contour 3D from that tender process. Mm. But we had another company during the week, Fortex 3D CP, right. and they're keen as mustard to start printing houses. Now, they believe they've got a solution for affordable and social and Aboriginal and NDOs housing, yeah, right. and that's great. So Council, are they going to build one here for us? Or? Well, I said definitely come along and build yeah, it. Yeah. Our planners know how to approve 3D printed houses with the right processes mm. in place. We've got land available in Dubbo, a whole range of reasons. Yeah. Absolutely. Get out there, please, and start doing it. They kind of almost, it seemed like they felt like council was the provider of some of those different types of housing. And I yep. explained that we're not the state government typically yep. and the federal government to a certain extent provide those type of housing. But mm. we would love them to be in here and doing that yeah. and come and talk to our builders. I'd We've love got, to see it as almost like a display home. Well, absolutely right. You could do that. Yeah. And I said we've got some very innovative, very progressive developers and builders in this city. Yep. Some of them were over inspecting our building mm. when the 3D printer toilet was going up. Mm. So I guarantee there'll be some of those. And people may be a little bit concerned about moving into a house that's been 3D printed as their investment because, again, they want to make mm. sure their investment is safe down the yep. track. But I'm sure people would be okay to rent it. Yes. And we've seen some floor plans from some different companies now and apart from a few rounded corners on a few different parts mm. of it, it doesn't look that different, mm. but it's faster to build. And yep. they made an estimation, this particular company we met with, made an estimation that it's about 20% cheaper to build. Yeah, right, okay. So faster to build, cheaper to build. Yep. We want people, people are wanting to move to Dubbo. Mm. We've got a demand there. Let's get in there and take advantage of it. So 3D toilet, step one, absolutely fantastic. Again, we've mentioned mm. before, the first government at any level to build any public infrastructure with that methodology. And that's exciting in its own right, isn't it? That is. It. And now we want to be out there leading the way in housing because I think this can help solve part of the housing problem yeah. across the nation. Yeah. The Voice. Well, it's uh, been a topical point of discussion, hasn't it, across the media in many, many forms. Uh, and it looks as though we, we talked about this uh, again a couple of podcasts back in regards to how council itself can feel as though they can be uh, assisting with educating people in this area to make a decision which they feel is the right decision to make. And, of course, council made it very clear they're not going to make a stand on this to say yes or no, but they want to be in the position to try to help educate. And as part of that is to run a panel event. Now, again, it looks as though a decision's been made, a date's now been set, and you're looking for expressions of interest for people who want to be part of this discussion, be on the panel, and I'd suggest maybe even moderate this debate. Is that right? We've got a moderator. We've got someone already you chosen have. to moderate that. Are you allowed to announce that, or is that something that's got to be up for uh, wait, this watch this space? Sort of I, thing? I won't announce it yet. I'm right. not sure if it is public information okay. yet, so I'll, I'll err on the side of caution there. But we are very keen to see people who have views for the yes, for the no, that are happy to participate in a forum, a public forum, mm. and have some questions from the floor, for example, and really just make sure people are educated. Mm. And you're spot on. We don't think it's appropriate. Our council has made a deliberate decision not to take a position. We don't think it's appropriate for council to tell you how to vote mm. for something. Mm. It's a decision that everyone needs to make for themselves. They're going to a referendum. No one's threatening them. No one's holding a gun to their head. They can write the word yes or write the word no. There's no box to tick. You've got to write mm. the word yes or write the word no in that, in the privacy of that voting by yourself. Mm. But we think we've got a role to play in education. So this forum, it's going to be held on the 10th of October? Correct. 6 p.m., 10th of October. Where at? Is that the DRTCC? Held, yeah, that'll be held on the flat floor component of like the DRTCC. the auditorium area there? Correct. Yep. And we want to make sure that we've got people that have got a good argument to present yeah. with the yes and no. So we've got expressions of interest open as we speak. We think ideally two yes, two no, maybe three yes, three no. Mm. Mm. We'll see what comes in in terms of those expressions of interest. Is there a particular person or group of people you're looking forward to sort of seeing put their expressions of interest forward? Not really, except councillors were keen to see locals involved in it rather than someone coming mm. from out of town. Okay. But we'll look at the 
background, the credentials, if you like, of the people, and we'll choose people that we think will be able to add to the debate, add information to the debate, and and give that good information Mm. for the yes and good information for the no Mm. to allow people to make up their own mind. There also is the ability to send in questions before the actual meeting, and those questions obviously will be checked to make sure that they might have four or five questions that are very similar, so we'll go, okay, well, we'll paraphrase those five questions into this Mm. one question because there's no point having the same question Mm. asked five times by five different people. So go to your say. You can register your expression of interest Mm. on your say. You can put a question in there as well. And again, you can register to attend on that. Now, you don't have to register to attend, but if we get to the stage where that is full, then obviously people that are registered will have preference to... You'll do a live stream on this as well, I suppose? Yeah, we will do a live stream. And again, I think that's important to expose this to as many people as possible. Mm. I think it's a good way to go. I've seen different councils take different positions on mm. it. I'm not going to tell other councils how to run their council. I've got a big enough job with this council. Yes. But again, I think this is the right way to go mm. to not try and tell people how to vote, but to tell people to be educated, even just getting registered, making mm. sure you're on the roll to vote. And there is pre-polling with this one as well. There'll be two weeks of pre-polling. So 10th of October is only a few days before was the 14th it, of October. 14th of October? Is that the date for the referendum? Correct, yeah. Okay. So hopefully enough people will see this before they actually vote on mm. the day itself. Public Spaces Tree Committee. The Tree Preservation Order is up for public exhibition. So... Again, we, we have spoken about this, and I think this is in reference to the whole idea of the, I suppose, the, the nature of trees in town and uh, whether or not we want things chopped down, how many trees we want planted. I think it's a fairly broad type of uh, proposal, isn't it, in regards to this? And how do we see the future of Dubbo going in regards to uh, trees in town? Controlling of uh, who gets to say what in regards to when certain trees have got to be lopped and all those type of things. Is that all part of this? It's a, quite an extensive scenario we're looking at? We've got a tree preservation order now Mm. and this relates to trees on private land Mm. and the way we work it now is that if someone's got a tree on some private land where they think it's significant they can ask for it to be added to the significant tree register that's then assessed and if it's added then it's got some protections in place. What would make for a significant tree? Probably the size and or age of that tree would be the, the two components. I'm not the one that judges whether it is accepted under the significant mm. tree register. But I did have a phone call the other day, interesting enough, from mm. a resident who said, oh, I wanted to do some tree lopping on some tree on on that was my neighbour's tree, but over on my property, etc. And the neighbour told me, I can't touch it because it's a heritage tree. Mm. And I think the neighbour was going down the right path, mm. but didn't have the terminology quite correct. Say, do we have heritage trees? Do they exist? No, but I, I did check the address this particular resident gave me, mm. and that address does have a significant mm. tree on it. So it's, they've got a tree on the significant tree register. Okay. But you can still do things. You just need to get permission to do things from right. So, so if it, it falls a significant tree, you just got to get permission to do the lopping. If you need to do something, and you've got to have mm. a reason for it, you can't just say, oh, it's a bit ugly, you probably mm. will get rejected. If you had a safety reason, if mm. you had a reason that you needed to do something on there, then you still could do it. Mm. Now, some people say that's enough. Some people say you need to do a lot more. There are different councils that have different tree preservation orders in place, Mm. they may relate to the height of the tree. If it's over five metres, eight metres, ten metres, whatever it might be, Mm. then you can't just touch it without getting permission. Or it might be the breadth of the tree at a certain height. So it might be just how thick the trunk is, for example. These are the sort of things that if we do go forward with the tree preservation order, there's been discussion around it. Mm. We are now going out there to ask the community what they think. Now, you've got until the 2nd of October to put a submission in, so I'd encourage people to do that. But we've also got two information sessions. One is at the auditorium at the Western Plains Cultural Centre. That'll be on the 19th of September from 6 to 7. Mm. And the other one will be at the Wellington Civic Centre, and that'll be on Wednesday the 20th of September, again from 6 to 7. So that's basically depending on when you listen to this podcast, yep. hopefully this week, you listen to it before Tuesday and Wednesday this week. Mm. So they're two information sessions, but you don't have to go to those. You can just have a read of potential parts of that policy. Yep. Again, it's on your say. Put your information in, send your submission in. We need that feedback mm. because there may be costs associated with this, both 
from an admin perspective from our side, or if you want to actually ask the thing to do, be done, mm. you might need to pay a fee to be able to have that assessed whether something can happen to Does that. Does this have anything to do as well with uh, tree planting and things like that, it's from a council perspective or from a, a private perspective? There's nothing no, like not on tree planting. The And this is all about private property. No, this is about public trees. This, this is all, all about, about your own personal property Correct. and what you can and can't do with your trees. That's right. So you can go and plant more trees on there, but let's say we had a tree preservation order that said, the tree got over five metres, you can't do anything with it. Mm. You could plant a tree and it grows up and it's 5.1 metres tall and you go, ah, oh, that's now in the road of my view of the lovely sunset. Mm. I want to cut it down so you can't do that. Mm. Well, hold on, I planted this tree. I planted this tree a few years ago. That's right. Well done. Thank you, sir, for planting that tree or sir or mm. madam. But you can't cut it down. Well, I want it's my land. So mm. these are things you've got to consider in that. Mm. Having said that, you need to get permission from council to build a new garage mm. or to build a carport. So if you're going to do things on your land, it still might be your land, but you might need permission to do it. Mm. That's where some people have said to me, well, you can't tell me what to do on my land. Well, depending on what it is, you might need permission mm. from council to mm. do that, or you might need a process to go through. So have a look at that. If you're in favour of it, if you're against it, if you want to put an opinion in about the size of tree, etc., have your say. That's the important part I now. I imagine it would create quite a bit of emotional discussion as well, I'd suggest. More than likely. <laughs> Now, Matt, uh, here's another word for us one in regards to a call-out. Call-out for local shop and shopkeeper photos from the Western Plains Cultural Centre. Are we are they looking at uh, creating a bit of a display here of some of the old pictures of shops and, uh, I don't know, I suppose, what's, what the old Dubbo used to look like in a bit of a display sort of format? What's, what's happening here? The Western Plains Cultural Centre is currently curating an exhibition that will be in the museum which will be called Storekeep. 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 I like this couple of good words there. Storekeep and curate. Yeah, that's right. You can use those next week. Thank you. And you've got, this will be on display in November, Mm. and it will be a bit of a history of stores and shops and businesses in the city. So this will be down at the Western Plains Cultural Centre as well. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. So it's being led by our local studies officer, Simone Taylor. Right. And so she's now put a call out to the community to say, if you've got a photo, if you've got something about a shop, and in particular, they were after the insides of shops. Oh, okay. They want to see that. And we do see a lot of the outside stuff, but we're not so much the inside. Yeah, okay. that's, that's right. Good. And just seeing some of the things that are being sold, some of the items mm. in those shops, I think will be absolutely fascinating for people yeah. to have a look at that. So if you've got shop, uh, sorry, photos of those shops, if you've got photos, even the outside of shops will be fine. Yeah. But anywhere, any time frame, from way back to 23rd of November, 1849, mm. when we were gazetted as a village, right through to the early 2000s. If Wonderful. you've got any photos of any of that time, send it through. You can call Simone, 68014436, or just send it as an email to her, right. simone.taylor at dubbo.nsw.gov.au. Ring the front. So you can take a photo of the photo or, or scan the photo. Scan and send the it photo, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and I'm sure if you did want to take your photo down to the cultural centre, they would scan it yeah, for you there as well. Yeah. Okay, great idea. Now, speaking of uh, everything to do with culture and art and all those wonderful things, it looks as though the uh, WA Regional Council has uh, joined up with a few of the primary schools in town to create a, an art in school strategy. So it's, it's just all part of a cultural plan of collaboration between schools and, uh, and the council here to try to raise the profile of, of culture in our community with the kids. One of the great challenges that primary school teachers have is that they need to be able to do a bit of everything. Oh, yes. In the morning, they might yes. be teaching grammar and they might be doing literature studies. Yeah. At lunchtime, they might be doing Pretending maths. They to know how to use a paintbrush after lunch. That's, that's exactly well, right. That's, that's that, that right. was me, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got to be able to do everything. So And, and the great work that our primary school teachers do, they've, they've got mm. young minds that they're molding into mm. wonderful adults. One of the items that it was noted was that there was potentially – a hole there was that it'd be great to add some support to the primary school teachers mm. with some expertise in art. Right. So a collaboration was put together. It's the first year we've done it. And we had West Dubbo Public School and yes. Bunninyong Public School. Well done. And there were students chosen from those. The teachers chose some students that showed some sort of inkling that they had some artistic talents. Nice. And then we brought in a real artist. So we okay. had Jack Randell, who's a, right. a well-known double artist. Yes. And he would go in and he would do some work in both Bunanyong and at West Dubbo Public School and did a few sessions with the kids in each. And then we had an exhibition what during the week. a fantastic idea. Yeah. And we had myself and 
Matt Wright, Councillor Matt Wright was there as well. He's the chair of the Spark Committee. Right. And so Spark. Spark. Is that an acronym for something? It is an acronym for something. Spark, spelt S P A R C, stands for Shaping Plans to Advance Regional Culture. Oh, you do well. I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we had that there, and basically we looked at some of the work that the kids had done. And keep in mind, mm. these were primary school kids. Yeah. And they had essentially taken some silhouette images that Jack mm. had provided mm. and turned them into these wonderful artworks and then there was a mm. display put in the classroom and it looked fantastic. Now, I sat down with some of the kids and just had a bit of a chat to some of them. Show off your artistic ability, did you? I didn't do any of that. You didn't Absolutely do that? didn't do any of that. The kids would have smashed me in their artistic ability. Uh, but man, talk to them. Man, man Dickinson, that's a stick figure. I've got something <laughs> far better over here. <laughs> and they would have, absolutely would have done. But they did this process, which I thought was quite clever that Jack mm. showed them, and they produced these great artworks. So I sat down with them and talked to them, but the kids loved the idea that they then had the skills to be able to do the same thing. So mm. Jack showed them a silhouette, and he brought in some various pictures of people and, and did mm. silhouettes on that, but then he showed them the technique. So mm. then he gave them a bunch of other just random photos, images, etc., mm. and they were using the technique they'd learned for the silhouette process right. to then create other artwork. So yeah. I thought that was actually quite a clever way of doing it. So yeah, it wasn't yeah. just a one-off, here's how you do it, end yep. of story. Here's how you do it, you know the technique, and you know how to do it in the future. Yeah. So let's go forward from is, there. Is this a Dubbo Regional Council initiative, or is this something that you've picked up from somewhere else as a council? As far as I know, it was an initiative from us. We might have picked up an idea from mm. somewhere. I'm not sure if our staff mm. said, I saw something happen similar to this. Mm. But absolutely, it was something that we did for the first time. And, and probably one of the things that I see about art in our community is that we are, without a doubt, developing and getting better. We're growing up as a community. Mm. Mm. And I think about many years ago, before we had the Western Plains Cultural Centre, before we had the Dubbo Regional Theatre and Convention Centre, mm. we had the Flat Four, the Civic Centre there, but not the theatre. Before we had rhino sculptures around our yes, community, yes. there was probably a fair bit of focus in Dubbo on sport. Mm -hmm. We had great sporting fields. We had mm -hmm. fantastic areas to play We've sport. We've always been excellent in that area, haven't we? We, we seem mm. to have been, I think. Mm. And then as we became a little bit more sophisticated and as we grew up a little bit, suddenly we had other things that started to be brought into our community, like mm. the cultural centre, like the theatre. And I think we're growing up. So even at the moment, out on public display is our draft public art strategy. Right Now, again, this ties in with the kids, if you like, where we're getting a collaboration with a local artist and some of the schools in primary school, primary school age to try and focus on developing art. We've got a public art strategy, which if you're interested in public art, go mm. and look at that strategy, make comments on it. Are you talking about sort of displays around the place with public art or what's, what's the whole aim of this strategy? The strategy is really to have more public art yeah. on public land. Mm. If you've got something on private land, if you've got your own shop, for example, you can put an artwork in that shop. That's your business, mm. what you do in that shop. But mm. we would like to see more public art. Now, there might be some people out there who have got to focus on the arts mm. and they might want to put some art in a public area, mm. but is there a policy to do that? Well, we don't really have that strategy in place okay. at the moment. So if people approach us, we'd kind of do it on an ad hoc, hoc basis. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Having a strategy in place would make more sense. So then Absolutely. we can say to people, here's our strategy. Anyone that's inclined to do this, then you should do it. Now, keep in mind the Amadi bequest, the Western Plains Cultural Centre is what it is now mm. because John Amarty, who used to own the Daily Liberal many Liberal, years yes. ago, he gave a bequest. And I remember Alan Smith telling me about the negotiations they went through mm. with that bequest. Mm. It was fairly high-level negotiations, but we got a significant amount of money from John Amarty for mm. that bequest to keep the cultural centre at the level, or to make the cultural yes. centre at the level it is now. Right. So there are people in the community who might be interested in some public art. Yes. Well, let's make sure we've got everything in place ready to, for that's them. That's a great idea. Yeah, absolutely. To do that. So that, that's happening at the moment. It's out on public display at the okay. moment. Make comment on it. Your say. Your say. Absolutely yep. right. You got the, you, you hit that on there. You're oh. all over this. Oh, absolutely. And Matt, uh, during the week, uh, you wrote your weekly Mirror Memo. And... Uh, your focus this week was an interesting one on status quo. Now, we're not talking about the band here, the famous <laughs> English band. We're, we're talking about the, the, the nature of change, I suggest, and the importance of sometimes, as uh, the very famous business manager and uh, marketing guru Tom Peters once said, if it ain't broke, you've got to break it. So is that what this is all about? It was about that because I actually do like the group of councillors we've got here at the moment because they've shown – in the past and hopefully in the future as well, mm. that they are prepared to do things a little bit different. Now, in public office, 
it would be very easy, incredibly easy, mm. to do things the same old way because you're probably not going to get criticised yes. by too many people very often. Oh, well, we've been doing it that way for the last 10 years. The last yeah. group of councillors did it that way. It's always way. worked. So I don't That's know right. why we've got to change it. So we'll just keep ticking away and keep mm-hmm. doing things the same old way. But you really want to make sure, if you want to be part of an exciting, progressive community, mm-hmm. you want a group of leaders yeah. that are innovative. Yep. So I think this community, this this group of councillors, sorry, mm-hmm. has shown that, and that's fantastic, and mm-hmm. I really admire that about them. And I suppose a few examples that come to mind, the Australia Day Ceremony, yes. 2023, we moved that to the night before in Wellington this year. It was a very year. bold idea and certainly created public discussion. It did, and public cri- criticism. There were people mm-hmm. criticising that idea, but Absolutely. fascinating that the federal government Change the rules, not just based on Dubbo, but certainly mm. that would have been one of the factors involved yeah, in that, yeah, yeah. and change the rules so that anyone can now do that from next year. Mm. So, again, trailblazing a little bit there. Mm. We've talked already about our 3D printed toilets. That's yep. certainly something that will be more commonly seen around the nation in years to come, and, mm. and we can go back and look at Dubbo being their first. In fact, one of the media outlets at the opening said to me this week, oh, do you think this is interesting that little old Dubbo was the first in the nation. And I went, well, that's part of the problem. Mm. People in Sydney may think that they're yeah, always leading well, the way. But we're not. But regional yeah. areas often do lead the way. Absolutely. Our light vehicle fleet, the electrification of that, we are way ahead, yep. way ahead of so many different areas around that. So I think that's really important mm. in terms of just that whole change. Uh, the res, I think we're, we're doing that well. And even, even with our standing committee meetings, mm. we made a – a bold and courageous decision at the time when we were first setting up, when we came together as a new council, first setting up the delegated authority for a whole range of different things, including for our CEO, including for our standing committee meetings. Mm. The previous council had allowed standing committee meetings to make council resolutions. And the whole process we talked about before mm. where you, you have a workshop, a yep. committee meeting, the three council. Step procedures. That's right. Well, the last council didn't have that in place. And it took a pretty bold and courageous decision because – that was a bit easier to do it that mm. way. You just went mm. to a committee meeting. The public didn't know about it much. You could slip things through without mm. the public knowing about it. You a whole it. process there by doing that, yes. And that's right. And so this council made a bold and courageous decision mm. from a governance perspective to say, no, that's inappropriate. Mm. We need to change that process and make it better. So I think when you see this council make a decision, when you see mm. something come out about it, and before you jump on social media and criticise what mm. this council is doing, just think about the big picture, the long-term vision and about making those bold and courageous mm. decisions. I think that's a really important part of any government. You don't really want a bunch of laggards no. on a government at any level. We you, can't afford to be in the modern world. We, I don't think you can be, but there are some areas where it's safe to do that, so that's mm. what people end up doing. So I, Until I, the outside world catches up with you well, and then surpasses you. Well, that's and it doesn't take long to do that, but no. I, I think you really need to be leading the way, mm. listening to community feedback. It's a fine line, listening mm. to community feedback, but also showing leadership. And I think this council, this group of councillors, has done that very well over mm. the almost two years we've been together so far and hopefully continue to do that for the next year. Yes. Well, it's time for the Limerick of the Week. So, Max, we've had a lot to get through again today. What have you chosen as your Limerick for the Week? It's getting tougher and tougher each week, but mm. I, I, do like, I do like the idea that we are a very progressive, innovative council, so I yes. thought, why not write a limerick on that? Oh, it's almost a little segue from our last little call. Wasn't Absolutely that's great. right. You, you timed it perfectly. In Dubbo, the council is awake. Bold and courageous steps we will take. Not a fan of the old, we are daring and bold. A future of difference we will make. Oh, well done. And he here, I'd suggest. Well, folks, that wraps up again for Straight from the Mayor's Mouth. Until next week, take care. Straight from the Mayor's Mouth with Matthew Dickerson from Dubbo Regional Council.